Welcome to Tell Us Something. Thank you for coming out tonight to support live storytelling. This is the first sold out Tell Us Something event. Every Tell Us Something event is focused on a theme. Tonight's theme is getting away with it. Lisa Venuti was born and raised in the South Bay area of California, where as a young adult, she had stints as a performance artist and as the lead singer of a punk dirge band. It's a thing. She moved to the Missoula area almost 30 years ago and now teaches at the University of Montana. She also raised two Missoula-born boys who are now young men and assuredly infinitely more responsible than she was at their age. Please welcome Lisa Venuti. I was sitting on a toilet in a toilet stall in a bathroom in the Ocho Rios, Jamaica airport. I didn't have to relieve myself. I had rushed in there to panic. I had gotten myself into a completely ridiculous situation, could be dangerous, could be life-altering, and I was trying to think of a way out, and I had nothing. So it was the early to mid-1980s, and I was in my early to mid-20s, and I had been traveling in Jamaica with my father. My father was a civil engineer, and he had been living in Kingston uh, for a few months, des uh, I think designing housing. And he had invited, invited any of his six adult children to come visit him. If we paid the airfare, he would take care of everything else. And I took him up on this offer. And it was the end of his stint. So we were traveling around Jamaica for two weeks and had a great time. And the last place we visited was Negril, which is a beautiful, at that time especially, small sort of town, village, beautiful beaches. And my father had made all the reservations for the accommodations. and. Um, he decided we would stay in an all-inclusive resort. And I was sort of not in the all-inclusive resort, but he was a civil engineer, and to him it was very practical. You didn't have to think about, you know, where you're gonna go eat or anything like that. So we, we I'm, it may have been the only one there at the time, I'm not sure, but we arrived there, and the name of this resort is Hedonism <laughs> Two. There's a hedonism one somewhere, I, th I think. <laughs> so uh, we go in, and I'm waiting for him to, to check in. And I'm in the lobby, and it's sort of tacky and a lot of mirrors around. And um, I'm watching him check in. And within 30 seconds, a guy that I, I will describe, he sort of had a, a New Jersey 1980s porn mustache, sort of <laughs> came up to me and, and hit on me and asked me if I wanted to go to the disco with him that night. And, um, I really wasn't into it, and I declined. And maybe some of you women out there, this has happened to you. Um, you're traveling with your father, you're in your 20s, you're in a Caribbean country, and you go to <laughs> check in to um, this resort, and you look around, and you pretty quickly realize you're in a clothing-optional swingers resort. <laughs> yeah. Awkward. <laughs> I have to admit, though, that my father, bless his engineer's heart and soul, I don't think he ever noticed. <laughs> but this was not my scene at all, and we didn't spend a lot of time there. We spent a lot of time in the village and doing other things, but one day I was alone, and I was trying to make myself as inconspicuous as possible, as inconspicuous as a young single woman with a mohawk, and painted chicken bone earrings can at a swingers resort. And I was on the beach and I was near like the, the fence. They had it sort of fenced off and I was on the opposite side of the nude, the naughty nude beach. I was just trying to, you know, read a book. And a young Jamaican woman came 
on the other side and asked if I wanted my hair corn road, you know, for $5 or something like that. Well, I declined because, as you can imagine, the last thing I wanted to do was walk around there looking like Bo Derek in 10. <laughs> um, so I declined. But I said, come on over and talk to me. But she couldn't. She said she'd get in trouble for being on the private beach. And I said, well, forget that. So she and I walked on the beach, and we kind of became friends. Her name was Nadine, and she was a couple years younger than I was. And we hung out. And she took me on her moped one day to her brother, where her brother grew pot. And I wasn't really a smoker, and I still am not really a smoker, but I thought it would be a really excellent idea to bring home some Jamaican marijuana for my narcissistic borderline personality drummer boyfriend. <laughs> and that's all one word. Um, so that brings us to the airport, where I had bought a little bit of pot, and I'd stuffed it inside a, one of those plastic toothbrush containers and had wrapped it up and put it in the side pocket of my backpack and thought everything was going to be okay. And we get to the airport and what's going on, but they're having everybody, the bags are being searched. And my father's ahead of me and there's one of those like stainless tables just like they have today. And there was a group of young Jamaican Rastafarian sort of looking men, quite handsome. And <laughs> They were searching, they had their suitcases out and they were open and the police, I assume they were police, uniformed, were looking through everything, everything. I mean, they were looking inside bags of peanuts. They were unrolling the underwear. They were looking inside the, the top of deodorant containers. And I thought, I am busted. I am so up the creek. I just, I, I th I'm looking at my father and I'm thinking in three hours I'm going to be having the shit beaten out of me by some tough Jamaican women wondering what this scrawny white girl's doing in their space in prison. And, um, you know, I'd seen Midnight Express. It was going to be an international incident. My father was going to lose his job. My, how was he going to tell my mother? I was his only daughter. I was their only daughter. I was their pride and joy. And I just didn't know what to do. And I, I, I ran into the bathroom, left my dad there with my suitcase. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> I ran into the bathroom, and I was just trying to think. I thought of, like, pulling it out and, um, you know, running into the bathroom with it, but that there was a policeman over there with a dog, and it seemed like everybody was watching me, and that wouldn't work, and I thought maybe I could pretend like I had a heart attack or I fainted or I was sick, and I, that just didn't seem plausible. And so in the bathroom, I just realized I... I had to just go out and face it. So I turned around and I walked back out. At this time, the, they were finishing up with the young Jamaican Rastafarian guys. There was kind of a group of them. They looked like they were all together and apparently had found nothing of interest. And then it was our turn. And so my father puts his suitcase on the table and scoots it along. And I'm looking at my father thinking, oh, you poor dad, you have no idea what's in store for you. Your daughter is about to get busted. And I put my backpack on, and the guard or, or policeman or whatever looked at my father, and he looked at me in a very sort of uninterested way and went... <laughs> and of course, the first feeling I felt was complete complete relief, kind of like waking up and realizing from a nightmare that, you know, you haven't really lost your child or, you know, something like that. Um, but the second thing I felt pretty quickly was kind of indignation um, <laughs> at the fact that I, it did not escape me that I, I escaped because of white privilege, really. And, but I was happy, I was happy. And half an hour later, half an hour later, as we, were, as we were getting on the plane, that group of young men was in the back of the plane. And one of them must have noticed something on my face because as I was about to sit down next to my father, he got up and came down the aisle and he held out his hand and he said, darling, in his beautiful Jamaican accent, you look like you need to come back here and party with us. <laughs> and well, I did. I let them buy me a couple gin and tonics on the way to Miami. Sorry, Dad, I left him, you know, sorry. It turns out that this group was with Burning Spear. 
and Burning Spear was sitting kitty corner to me over there, and um, I, I, of course, it was it was a nice time. And um, besides the flight from Miami to Houston, where we had to dump all the fuel over the Gulf and turn around and make a an emergency landing, the rest of the journey was pretty much uneventful. When I got home to California, I gave this gift that I had risked so much for to my narcissistic borderline personality drummer boyfriend who let me know that it was the shittiest pot he ever smoked. <laughs> Dixie Rayleigh is a native Montanan and has lived here most of her life, except for an adventure or two where her body moved elsewhere, but her heart stayed here. She has always returned to Missoula to be reunited with her heart. She is slightly magical and not afraid to break a nail. She's not afraid to get dirty or help someone in need. Please welcome Dixie Rayleigh. It's 1980, and I'm living in Billings, Montana, and I'm taking a class called Inner Pyramid Science, where we're studying the metaphysical properties of the pyramids. The teacher announces that he's going to be taking a tour group to Egypt in October, and if anybody would like to go to let him know. I instantly thrust my hand in the air and said, I'll go. Now, my twin sister, Diane, had taken the class uh, the year before me. And so um, she said that she'd go along with me and had a couple of classmates that might be interested, a girl named Vona and a man named Greg. So when October rolled around, the four of us joined this tour group to Egypt. We were staying in a hotel that was about two blocks from uh, the pyramid complex where there's three pyramids and the Sphinx. And so we saw them every day. And to see them in real life is just the most amazing thing. They're huge and ancient and exotic, and it's unbelievable. And so one day um, when we went to tour the pyramid and go inside, we were standing uh, out in front waiting in this large group of people taking turns going inside, and um, we were talking about you know, the things that we knew about the pyramid, and Greg said, you know, it'd be cool to climb the pyramid. I've heard that people do that. You know, and you, it's illegal, you could end up in prison in Egypt, you know, and again, the Midnight Express thing, right? And there's, and then he said, there's a guy named Fadag, he's an Egyptian man, and he was a bit of a legend at that time, most people who've been to Egypt at that time have heard of Fadag. And he places himself around the pyramid at night, he's like a self-appointed guard, and he's just random. Sometimes he lets people climb, sometimes he calls the guards and has them arrested, and sometimes he charges them a fortune to climb. So the best thing to do is avoid the guy entirely, but it doesn't sound like it's a very easy thing to do. So, you know, we, we're waiting in the crowd and we go up and it's, you know, broad daylight, and of course the real guards are there at the corner of the pyramid, and these guys take themselves quite seriously. They've got official uh, guard uniforms on, they've got these belts that go around and across the shoulder. They've got a billy club and other paraphernalia with which to subdue the unruly. <laughs> they've got assault rifles with bayonets and they're standing there looking ever so seriously and there's a sign beside them. And across the top of that sign snakes the message in Arabic and on the bottom in big, big block letters missing the apostrophe, it says, don't touch the walls. And I'm looking at that going, okay, how are you gonna climb the pyramid if you can't touch the walls? But then I remember uh, that's kind of the point, don't touch the walls. And so I've got a 35 millimeter camera around my neck. <clears throat> and as we approach these guys, I gesture to them that I'd like to take their picture. So the one of them kind of nods and says, that'll be okay. So I put my camera up and focus and take the picture. 
And then I put my camera down and I'm just standing there mesmerized by what I'm looking at. These two guards and all their weaponry and the sign and then back to the guards and the sign and then I look up the pyramid and back down to the sign and at the guard and he's looking me square in the eyes like he knows what I'm thinking. <laughs> and he leans forward and in a thick accent he says, not to touch the walls. <laughs> so I smile and you know turn back with my group and so we've become friends with one of our tour guides, his name's Adif. So we get together with Adif that night and we thought, we're gonna run this plan by Adif and see what he has to say about this. So we tell Adif our little plan of climbing the pyramid and no, 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 you mustn't do this, you mustn't do this. People get arrested doing that. They will put you in prison in Egypt. They won't send you to America. They'll put you in prison in Egypt. You must not do this. If you decide to do this, you know, and then he starts telling us about Farag, right? Let's go, oh God, here we go with Farag again. So he's telling us about Fada, yeah, 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 we know. And he says, if you're going to do this, I will not be involved. I do not want to hear about it. So then we go around Egypt on our tour and with this in the back of our minds and we're at a tent party one night where there's um, these belly dancers with candelabras on their head and exotic music and this guy rides in on a little beautiful Egyptian Arabian horse and this horse is belly dancing. And I talked that man into letting me ride that horse in the desert that night. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> and so um, we're touring around Egypt riding camels in the desert and it's just amazing. We're there for three weeks. We got a couple of days left. We come back to Cairo and um, we're staying at that hotel again and we're going, are we gonna do this thing or ain't we? So we decide, yeah, we're, we're, we're gonna do it. We're gonna climb the pyramid. So we get up at 1.30 in the morning and um, we're sneaking you know, down to the pyramid complex and there's a road that goes in front of it that's lit up with street lights through part of it. Now it's the middle of the night, it's pitch black dark and there's this huge light shining up the front of the pyramid so that it glows at night and um, we know that Farag is over there and he sees us in all of this light. I mean, we're in the desert, there's nothing to hide behind. So we, you know, we get to the road and we're going, okay, we're just walking down this road. You know, we're not up to nothing, we're just walking down this road. So, so when we run out of light, we cut back across the sand and we, as soon as we get to the, um, to the pyramid in the dark, we hear oh, 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 this man's voice. Oh, God, it's Farag. He's caught us, you know. So Vona and Diane and I are just standing there like three sweet little American girls that have never done anything wrong. Fadig speaks English, and so Greg is explaining to him that we're students from America. We've been studying the pyramid, we've been inside it, and we've been around it, and we've ridden camels around it, and we're just amazed by it. And now we would like to climb it. <laughs> And so Fadak thinks that's pretty cool, you know? We're kind of on the same page as him. We're all in love with the pyramid. So he's gonna let us climb. So Diane and Greg and I have all climbed things before we're outdoorsy people. Vaughn is a city girl, we didn't know that. So she's beginning to wonder if she's gonna be able to do this. So Fadak offers to help her and she pays him 20 bucks and we all start climbing the pyramid. Now, the stones are different sizes as you go up the pyramid, so sometimes they're almost five feet high. It could be kind of challenging. So as we're going up, we hear Vona down below. And then Fada. So it's like they're arguing. So we finally get up to the top of the pyramid, and Vona tells us that um, Fada was basically pushing her up the pyramid by the butt. And she, didn't, she didn't think much of that. So... Um, we're up there on top. It's, it's not, it doesn't come to a point anymore. It's square. So it's like 12 feet or, you know, in a square, 12 or 15 feet. And we're standing up there and it's just absolutely amazing. Uh, the sunlight is beginning, you know, as the sun is coming up, there's this little band of sunlight and oh, it, it's unbelievable up there. And the sky comes up over the side and God, excuse me, it's kind of scary up here, so I'm dying of thirst. My, I'm getting thirsty. Anyway, so <laughs> bear, bear with me, I'll, I'll survive. <laughs> anyway, so um, this, this guy comes up over the side, 
And he looks really familiar to us. And um, we ask him who he is, and it turns out it's the actor, Richard Chamberlain. <laughs> so, oh good, people know who he is. It's kind of like Richard, I mean, um, George Clooney, for those of you who don't know who he is. So we're standing there talking to Richard Chamberlain, and he's telling us about Farag, and we're telling him about our Farag encounter. And then we're just up there watching the sun come up, and, and the town is beginning to awaken down below in the outskirts, and dogs are barking, and the chanting from the prayer towers, Allah, and it's just magical. It's just the most extraordinary experience. So. Um, when the sun is all the way up and it starts to get light, there's a little bit of activity down around the front of the pyramid. So Richard and his friend begin to, to go down, and he says, don't stay up here too long. If the guards see you up here, they'll meet you at the bottom and arrest you. Oh my God, we hadn't thought of that. We just thought about coming up, you know? So we go, <laughs> so we go darting back down the way we came, and as soon as we get down to the sand, Greg says, spread out. So we spread out and we all start running running through the sand. Have you run in sand? It's not easy. <laughs> so we're running through the sand. <laughs> and I look over and my twins beside me, running in zigzags, so that, so that if they started shooting at us, she'd be a harder target. <laughs> so we finally, we finally get back to that road, and we're, we run across the road, and we run down this little embankment, and we're like, <gasps> You know, and we turn, see if anybody's after us. Nobody's there. We got away with it. Christy Hager is a self-employed photographer and painter. She has been a mostly law-abiding resident of Missoula since 1997. She enjoys long walks with her dog and thrift shopping. Please welcome Christy Hager. I got busted <laughs> twice in six months for the same offense just last year. You know, this, this just doesn't sit well with me. I'm such a compliant person. And, um, you know, I just, um, I try to put my subversive side into art where it might do some good. But I, I got into trouble and the first time it was, it was, it was just ignorance. I thought I just had to keep the leash on my dog, May, for the first 100 yards of Waterworks Hill. But the animal control officer said, no, read the sign. It says 200 yards. Okay. But that cost me 75 bucks. Right, that's two tanks of gas. You know, I can't let this happen again. And so I'm really, really vigilant. And we walk every day and I, I just am totally compliant until that Friday. It was about a year ago in December and it was dark out. I mean, it was almost dark, late afternoon and it was snowing. And uh, we got about 30 yards up from the parking lot. <clears throat> and uh, I had to stop and adjust my trekking poles and my gloves and hat. And, and so I let my end of the leash on the ground. And then my dog, May, starts walking in that tight little nervous circle that she does that indicates she's about to poop. And so I, I really don't want her to poop on the leash. So I just, I, I just you know, abandon reason and I take the leash off. And um, when I look up, 
that same animal control guy. <laughs> He's charging through the snow right to us. So, um, you know, I wanted to just point at May and say, it's her fault. But, you know, I knew that was wrong and useless. So uh, I, I just felt so angry and, and stupid and broke. <laughs> you know, that happy holiday feeling. And... Uh, So, uh, you know, and that just hangs on through the whole weekend until I, you know, until Monday when I can get to court and find out just how broke. And it's a hundred bucks second offense. You know, this is a public service announcement for you guys, really. So, uh, so there goes Christmas. And then I, uh, the clerk says, well, you have three options. You can pay it all now or you can um, uh, set up installment payments, or you can do $20 court costs and eight hours of community service. So, of course, I choose community service because I don't want the city to get another nickel of my <laughs> Christmas money. And so I looked through the list of nonprofits, and of course, none of them need an artist. But I, I choose the Senior Center Thrift Store, and <clears throat> I set up, uh, right away, I set up two four-hour shifts, because I just want to get this behind me and start the new year clean, you know. So, um, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, but it's not that thrift store, thrift stores have been good to me, you know. <laughs> and um, so... Uh, it's like in lean times, it's a necessity, and then at other times, it's like a recreational habit for me. It's, it's like fishing, because it's relaxing, and it's so full of promise. You know, but I, I just know this, given the circumstances, this isn't going to be the same, because, um, you know, it's court-ordered. And, but, uh, you know, I just have to, I just have to go with it. And so my, my first day at the thrift store, um, the head volunteer, Margaret, she puts me to work sorting sweaters, which I do really expertly according to color. And right away I find this beautiful red hand knit, 100% wool cable stitch sweater that's perfect for Christmas. And so I go up to Margaret and say, can I start a little savings pile of things I'd like to purchase? And she says, oh sure, um, there's a cubby behind the counter and volunteers get half price. <laughs> well, I, I decide this is not the time to try to get away with anything. So <clears throat> I say, well, you know, I'm not really a volunteer. I'm." court ordered here. <laughs> and yeah, she says, well, that doesn't matter. You still get half price. And uh, so I kind of work and uh, shop my way through the morning. And then I take a break at noon and go upstairs for lunch, which is a great deal. It's a, like three course hot meal and dessert for $4. And uh, and the cashier won't take my money. She says, well, volunteers eat for free. <laughs> so, of course, I say, well, you know, I'm not exactly a volunteer. I'm, I'm court ordered here. And she says, that doesn't matter, you still eat for free. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's starting to feel like family here. I mean, <laughs> You know, the good, the good part of family. So, um, <laughs> so then I notice, I notice these two women, they're decorating this fake fireplace tableau that's right next to the dining area 
with real stockings and garlands. And, uh, but of course, I notice what's missing because I'm an artist <laughs> and that's my job. So I, I, I say, you know, there's no fire in the, in the fireplace. It's just a black rectangle and I go up to them and I start out with compliments, but then I say, you know, <clears throat> this would look cozier if you had flames in there. And they say, well, we thought of that too, but we just don't know how to do it. <laughs> so I say, leave it to me. And I go back to work just thinking about the, the flames I'm going to paint that night and, um, and then deliver the next morning like some kind of art elf, you know. And then <laughs> it, it sort of goes unspoken that I am not supposed to handle money. And, um, <laughs> but Margaret and the other volunteers are just too polite to ask me what I did, what I did, you know, to get here. So, uh, I kind of like keeping them in the dark, actually. <laughs> but by, by the second day, I figure I don't want their imaginations to go crazy, so I let it slip to my coworker that day that, you know, I broke the leash law, I got a stiff fine that I can't afford, what with Christmas coming, and, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't respond, she doesn't say anything. But the next thing I know, she's pointing out things that I might have missed, that I might like. And she says, well, did you see that leather coat, that bomber's jacket over in the men's? I think it's your size. And it is my size. And it's my goddaughter's size, and I hope she likes it. And then, uh, and then there's that, like, hot pink, sort of Mr. Rogers type cardigan, and I know that's gonna work for somebody on my list. <laughs> and, and just when I think my shopping spree is done, I look in this sort of pile of sad camera bags and duffels and backpacks, and I see this Blackburn pannier, which is French for saddlebag, for my bike. And these things are pricey but it's five bucks before my discount. <laughs> and um, I'm just a total fox in the hen house. And, uh, you know, my uh, so-called compliant self is really loving it. And I'm, like, I'm paying my debt to society and making out like a bandit. It's ridiculous. So then my time is up, and I pull all of my stuff out under the counter, and, Ma and Margaret starts making a tally sheet while I bag things. And we get down to the last items, which are two quite fragile Christmas ornaments. And they're already half price. They're two, two for a quarter. And uh, I, I'm good with that, you know? But my eyes pop when she puts down 12 and a half cents. <laughs> so I say, oh, make it 13. <laughs> I'm so generous here. So, uh, you know, um, I say my goodbyes and I haul everything up the stairs. My car is just overflowing with presents, plus the leftovers from my second free lunch, <laughs> which I share with May, who totally deserves it. And uh, Christmas is saved. So, you know, I just, I just went back there last, yesterday, to check on the flames. And the flames abide. They are saved for this year's Christmas display. And uh, I think about volunteering, but I just, um, you know, know it, it won't be the same because that, that sweet spot of compliance and subversion and Christmas, <laughs> it's just so juicy. 
I wasn't just a fox in the hen house. I was a court-ordered fox <laughs> in a generous hen house. Thank you.